message in there for us that we don't want to miss. And as this morning we come to the church at Sardis, we're going to find that these folks had definitely decided to follow Jesus. And every one of us needs to come to that point in our life at some time when we make a decision that we are going to follow Jesus. And that decision usually comes with some cost in one way or another. For some more, for others less. But the most important question we can ask in our lives is, have we decided to follow Jesus? The song has an interesting uh, genesis about it. In, 19, in the 19th century, late 19th century, there was a huge revival uh, in the country of India. And uh, thousands, if not millions, of people come to know the Lord. The man who is credited with starting that revival, name is totally unknown. But the story behind this song, uh, as uh, recounted to some missionaries later on, goes like this. There was a missionary that came to this particular village and this man, his wife, and their two sons converted to Christianity. They decided to follow Jesus. Well, as still today, if you follow the news in parts of, certain parts of India, that's a dangerous thing to do and can come with extremely high cost. So the, the villagers and the, the heads of the village got together and they arrested this man and his wife and his two sons. And they brought him to the, the town gathering and they asked him to recant his faith. And purportedly his response was, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And they immediately had some archers that they had assembled there shoot down his two sons. And then they asked him again to recant. And he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And they killed his wife. And so they asked him a third time. And he said, though none go with me, still I will follow. I have decided to follow Jesus, and they killed him. Now, I doubt that any of us will ever face that kind of cost, but we all face some cost. And there will come, become moments in our lives when unless we have firmly decided to follow Jesus that we will equivocate. We will waver, we will waffle, we will become like our church that we looked at uh, last week. And we will try so hard to blend in with our surroundings, with our community's ethos and, and so forth, that we will prove that we had never decided to follow Jesus. So this morning we come to the church at Sardis, or, or the church at Philadelphia. Excuse me. If there's any church that we would want to emulate, it is this one. This Philadelphian church. This is... Uh, one of only two churches where Jesus has no condemnation for them. And this is the only church where he openly says, I love you. Actually, he says, I have loved you. Now, unlike Sardis, you remember last week, Sardis was the big church, the, the, the end church, the, the place where all the celebs went, and they got along great with the community, and they accepted everybody and everything. Well, unlike them, and there was no persecution for them, but unlike Sardis, Philadelphia is facing all kinds of persecution, se severe persecution, from what Jesus terms the synagogue of Satan. And who, who makes up this synagogue of Satan? Are the J Jews who, instead of embracing Jesus as the Messiah, have rejected him. And so God refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. Now, some people may say, well, that's pretty strong, Pastor, to call people members of the synagogue of Satan. And I agree it is. But it's not my term. It's God's term. You see, one of the things that I hope you're getting that, that is coming home to me loud and clear as we go through this series about these seven churches is God looks at things so much differently than we look at things. 
The things that we count as high on our list are not so high on God's list. And the things that we sometimes don't think much about are right up there at the top of God's list. And he's very black and white. All through scripture, all through time, there are two groups of people on the earth. There are those who are of their father, the devil, and there are those who are of their father, Jesus Christ. Now again, you say, well, pastor is pretty strong. Yes, but it's not my words. Who, do, who am I quoting when I say they're of their father, the devil? Jesus. He's the one said that. So if you have a, if that's tough for you, if you want to have a discussion with that, uh, talk to Jesus. He'll be glad to talk to you, by the way. In John chapter 8, verse 44, he, he's, there's a bunch of Jews, Pharisees, who have rejected Jesus. They're having a discourse with him. And Jesus says to them, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. It's that plain. So, we can infer from that, that if we are of our father Jesus Christ, then our will should be what? To do his desires. To do the things of his kingdom. You see, Satan's desire is to destroy the church. Which we know he can't do. Because again, Jesus said that the church will endure. That he's the one that's going to build it. But Satan still tries. And tries and tries. You remember last week, the church at Sardis... What was Satan's strategy to destroy that church? It was unbridled toleration, right? It was from within. There was no persecution from without. He didn't need to bring persecution from without because the church was fallen apart from within. Now they looked good. We'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But they were not good. As with Smyrna, if you remember Smyrna, Jesus offers no rebuke to this church at Philadelphia. Nothing but commendation. It's interesting that Smyrna and Philadelphia both lacked resources. They both lacked resources. If you remember, Smyrna was poor. Chapter 2, verse 9. You read that. Jesus says, I know you guys are poor. You remember what he said though? But you are rich in my eyes. They were poor in monetary things, but they were rich in spiritual things. And we need to learn that lesson. And, and we need to keep learning it over and over again. We, we can choose sometimes, oftentimes, to be rich in material ways or rich in spiritual ways. Now, sometimes we're really blessed and we can have both. And that's super. I like that. But just because there are times when we don't have material resources doesn't mean we aren't blessed by God. Okay. Well, Philadelphia, he doesn't say they're poor, but he says this about them. He says, you have little power. The church was pretty insignificant in the community. Unlike Sardis that we looked at last week that was very influential. Remember, Sardis was the big church. It was the church where all the dignitaries went. It was the church that you wanted to be seen at. If you were, in, if you were a business person in the community, you wanted to belong to the church at Sardis. Sardis had uh, the big pastor's conferences, and the pastors would come from all over to find out how Sardis did things. And the pastor wrote books, and he was on the radio. And Oh, no, they didn't have radio. Got carried away. But anyway, it, from the outside, from a human's perspective, they look great. And that's not to say large churches can't be spiritually great, because they can be. Okay? But they aren't necessarily inherently so because of their size. On the other end of the spectrum is Sardis. They have not much of anything. They're persecuted by the community because they won't equivocate on their stand for Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus says, you have little power. So, how will Jesus reveal himself to this church 
with little power. Well, we have it here in, in verses 7 and 8. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door. Jesus reveals himself to these folks as the Holy One, the true one, the one who controls the door. Despite pressure from the Jews to renounce their faith in Jesus, the Philadelphian believers had not denied him. You know, you can, you can kind of hear it now. You know, the folks say, come on. You don't have to be so narrow. What do you mean Jesus is the only way? What do you mean by grace are you saved through faith? Who would believe that? You've got to do this. You've got to be a part of our group. You've got to do what we do. Come on. Doesn't the Bible say not to judge? You, you shouldn't be judgmental of people. Come on. Be tolerant. Be kind. Be loving. All of those are good things, by the way. But not indiscriminately. The Philadelphian believers refuse to just blindly accept things. They refuse to equivocate from what Scripture says. You know, one of the five pillars of the Reformation that, that we stand on here at, at Parkside Church is sola Christos, Jesus only. You want eternal life? Jesus only. It's the only way. He has the key to the door. He opens the door. He closes the door. You want salvation? You want eternal life? Decide to follow Jesus. Oh, but that's so narrow. That's so uncivilized. That's so, and here's the word, you know, that we, none of us want to be branded with. We're so intolerant. Well, maybe so. In John chapter 14, verse 6, let's just see if Jesus is uh, the, only, the only way. See what John has to say about it. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. So how many get to the Father without Jesus? None. Nobody. Very intolerant. Very narrow. Very strict. Uh, Peter, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, says there's no other name under heaven given by which men might be saved. Jesus. So how many other names are there? According to Peter? None. Pretty narrow. Pretty intolerant. Pretty scriptural. And what would we rather be? Tolerant or scriptural? I think scriptural. Yes, this is very exclusive, but at the same time, it is very inclusive. And you say, how so? Because, moved by his love, before the foundations of the earth, Paul tells us in Ephesians, he predestined us to become a part of his kingdom. Now who is the us? The us is an amazing group of individuals. We used to sing about them when I was a little kid. Red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. From every tribe and every people group, God is calling out a people to be his own. That's pretty inclusive. From all eternity, God has been calling people out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And this is the truth that the Philadelphians need to have reinforced. Jesus says to them, I am the true one. I am the holy one. And then he adds, who has the key? The key. And he says, I have set before you a door. 
And the door that I, when I open it, no man can shut it. The door is into his messianic kingdom and cannot be shut by anyone other than Jesus Christ. It's interesting here in, in verse 8, Behold, I have set before you an open door. That's in the perfect tense. And, and what the perfect tense means in the Greek language is it's something that has happened. It's an accomplished action that continues on. So he has set before his church an open door. And he did that in eternity past. And that continues on into eternity future. And no man can shut that door. Once the Holy Spirit puts his seal upon you, nobody can take that away from you. No group can deny you entrance into God's messianic kingdom. When by grace he reached down through time and space and brought us in through that open door. That's how he reveals himself to these Philadelphians. Because they have said they've decided to follow Jesus. And he says to them, you've made the right choice. And it cannot be taken away from you. Because I'm the one, Jesus, that holds the key to the kingdom. You'll remember in the very beginning in chapter 1 of Revelation, he revealed himself as the one who holds the keys to heaven and hell. Again, it's he who holds the keys. Well, what does he have to say to these folks? The commendation. We're still in verse 8. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. That's pretty cool. How would you like Jesus to say that about you? Most of us, I would hope he could say that about. Maybe all of us. I don't know. You have kept my word and not denied my name. So again, Jesus doesn't look on whether or not they are influential in the community. He doesn't look on whether or not they are powerful, whether they are wealthy, whether they are tall, whether they are whatever they are. He looks at their faithfulness. And that's what he commends. If you want to be commended by Jesus Christ, be faithful. Be faithful. Be true to his cause. When he says you haven't denied my name, he's not talking narrowly here about somebody asking you if you believe in Jesus and then you saying no. No, it's much broader than that. He's saying your actions, your lifestyle over time prove that you decided at some point to follow Jesus. Now, some of my Calvinist friends would say, well, wait a minute. You didn't decide at all. God chose you. Well, that's true. He did. I've been a Calvinist a long time. I was a Calvinist when Calvinist wasn't cool. It's kind of the end thing now, but it wasn't 30 years ago. But anyway, yeah, I believe God chooses. That's what his word says. But there's a point in time when we make a decision. Now, we make that decision based upon his calling. But we still have come to a point in our lives where we decide to follow Jesus. When he reveals himself to us. And if you've never made that decision, I would encourage you today is the time to do that. We'll talk a little more about that shortly. They had little power. But Jesus says, you have not denied my name. If you were to visit Philadelphia in that time, and you were to visit the synagogue of Satan, it would not look like the synagogue of Satan. It was very prosperous. It was the end place to be in Philadelphia. It would look like there was, it was vibrant, it, was, it had funds, it had things going on, it was cool. If you were to go visit the church of Philadelphia, well, you know, the building, if they even had a building, was probably in disrepair. There weren't very many people there. And it just wasn't the place to be. And from our human perspective, we would look at all that and we would say, aha, God is blessing the synagogue and not the church. When in fact, just the opposite is true, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God seems to have a little different 
scale than we do. Jesus himself says to them, you are significant because you have kept my word. You are significant because you have kept my word. Another pillar of the Reformation, sola scriptura, right? Scripture only. Christ alone, scripture only. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. Sola Christos, sola fide, a third pillar. Faith alone. See? So, what's going to become of it all? What, are, what will be the results of their faith? So far, it doesn't look too good. Let's look at verse 10. Well, let's start with verse 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. So there's going to be a day when the persecutors realize, whoops, God loved those people. He loved those people. Uh, Cynthia, who does our sign, does such a great job on that sign, here a while back had something out, out there to the effect of, after Judgment Day, no more choices. I didn't do it exactly right, but that's true. There's going to come a day when if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, too bad, too late, the door's closed. Just something to think about. Uh, I, was, I was over at uh, Western Seminary last week, listened to Art Arzerdi do a, a sermon on, of all things, uh, the Laodicean church. And he had a great thing he used. And I'll use it from time to time. I'll just let you know I'm ripping it off from him so you don't think it was original to me. But as he was going through his message, every once in a while he would stop and he would say, is Jesus talking to them? Or to you and I thought man that's effective because that's what we really need to ask ourselves whenever we're looking at Scripture yes he's talking to the church at Sardis but who else is he talking to talking to you and to me because this message is for all time so I thought that was really cool arts a fantastic preacher by the way they have kept his word now he will keep them from the hour of testing. Because you have kept my word, verse 10, about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Wow. Well, don't we all dwell on the earth? In a sense, but that's not the sense Christ is talking about here. He's talking about earth dwellers in the sense that they are, their citizenship is here. We live here, but our citizenship is in heaven. Dwell means here to abide, to remain, to stay, to set up your camp, to be in that place. And again, we're back to this issue that there are always two peoples. There are those that don't know God and those that know God. All the time. And he contrasts them over and over again. So let's look at a little Bible interpretation here. I will keep you from the hour of trial. Well, what is this hour? That should ask the question. What, what is that? Well, I think three things stand out about this, this hour. And the first is, it's brevity. Revelation is full of symbolism, right? And that, and we see it all the time. So he's talking about an hour here, as opposed to other places where he talks about three and a half days, some places he talks about 42 months, some places he talks about a thousand years. So and relatively speaking, this is going to be a short period of time. The second thing I see here is its focus. The whole world. Now, we can really get off here if we're not contextualizing. What does he mean by the whole world? Well, some would say, well, it's a tribulation that's going to come on the whole world and the whole thing going to hell in the handbasket and that's it. But that's not what he's talking about. 
what, there's one other place in Scripture where we see the exact, this exact phrase, the whole world. And that's something we'll be looking at coincidentally, or <laughs> not, next Sunday. And, and that's in uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Remember, when the days when Caesar Augustus was emperor, he sent out a decree that who should come? The whole world. The decree went out to the whole world. Now, did that mean, did that decree circumnavigate the globe? No, of course it didn't. The whole known world is what they're talking about there. And the same thing he's talking about here. It's just like when we use the phrase, I could use the phrase that the whole world knows that we have a great worship team. And nobody would quibble with that because you would know what I was talking about. You would know I didn't mean every single person living on the earth today, but in generally everybody around here. And that's what he's talking about when he says the whole world. Its focus is the known world and those who dwell on the earth. See, that's who this trial is coming on. Those who dwell on the earth. And third is its restraint. Jesus will keep his people from this hour. That's what he says there, isn't it? Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. You see the two groups. There's you, the church, and those who dwell upon the earth. But we need to understand one more thing. Jesus is not talking here about physical suffering. Okay? There's no place in Scripture where Jesus promises to keep us from physical suffering in this world. In fact, quite the opposite, isn't it? You know, we read in places like John 16:33. Uh, we all know that verse. In this world you will have what? Tribulation, trouble, problems, trials, physical maladies, financial struggles, all those kinds of things. In this world we will have tribulation. John chapter 10, verses 26 here through 29. Uh, but you do not believe because you are not my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Now, there's a couple of promises there. We'll never perish, and no one will snatch us out of his hand. That's what he's trying to say to these Philadelphians. You've remained true. You decided to follow me. Now, you've got all these people telling you you've made the wrong choice, telling you you can't, it, it can't be that simple, it can't be that easy, there's got to be something else you've got to do. And he says, no, no one can snatch you out of my hand. However, we can never assume that Jesus will keep believers from, his, from this trial by removing them from the scene or shielding them from pain. In fact, in his, in his high priestly prayer, in John chapter 17, verse 15, what does he say? He says, he's talking to the Father, and he says, I don't ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them through this world. Okay. So, Jesus is talking about our remaining faithful. Once we decide to follow Jesus, we're, we come to that decision because of God's grace. That decision is kept strong by God's grace. You see? You know, in, in 1 John, John talks about people that look like they've accepted Christ. They even say they've accepted Christ. But then they turn their back on him and walk away. And what does he tell the, the folks there in 1 John? He says, they went out from us because they were never one of us. If you, you can make a decision to follow Jesus solely in the flesh for any number of reasons. Okay, and we, we probably all know people that have done that and then they walk away. 
But if you decide to follow Jesus based on the Holy Spirit drawing you into his kingdom, no man can snatch you out of his hand. And that's what Jesus wants these Philadelphians to know. And finally, the rewards for their faithfulness. What, what's in it for them? Well, here it is. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own name. Ooh. Well, Revelation is just full of symbolism and things, isn't it? Here we got crowns, pillars, names. What's the big deal about all that? Well, the crown spoken of here is what we call the crown of faithfulness. Given to those who remain faithful in spite of all kinds of temptation to do otherwise. It is a crown that some will receive when we step into eternity. It has nothing to do now with salvation. The crown, uh, perhaps a good way to, to explain it, it's like receiving the Medal of Honor. There, thousands fight, but only a few receive that medal because it's special. It's for the people that do something really special. And so this crown of faithfulness, we're all in the fight, we're all going to step into heaven, some will receive that crown. That's pretty cool. And what Jesus is saying to these Philadelphians, you may be put down now, you may be oppressed now, you may be of no consequence now, but one day, all the believers are going to see you receive this crown of faithfulness. I'd say that's pretty cool. Well, what about pillars? How many of you want to be a pillar? Who's the most famous pillar in the scripture? Lot's wife, right? She's a pillar of salt. Well, I don't want to be a pillar of salt. Well, you won't be. Again, we're, we're using figurative language. It, it's, it's like when they called... Uh, some of the apostles pillars well what he's talking about here we're going to be pillars in his temple well where's the temple going to be when Christ returns it's going to be universal right because he's going to be everywhere there's no need for the sun because he's going to be the light the temple is everywhere it's not a thing made with blocks so pillars he's saying to us he's saying to the Philadelphians that you, again, may be of little consequence now in your little community, but one day you're going to be an integral part of my temple. You are going to be a significant person in my kingdom. I'd say that's pretty cool. What about this name? What's the big deal about that? He keeps talking about that. Well, in Scripture, names are a big deal, right? Because in that culture, names were much more significant than they are to us. Uh, names signified possession. If I named you, if I had the right to name you, it signified possession, it signified superiority. When Adam was naming the animals, that sort of thing. When you named your son, uh, children were chattel in those days, and uh, you owned them, and, and those sorts of things, your daughter. They also symbolized relationship. And so what Jesus says is, one day I'm going to give you a new name, and you're going to know my name in a way that you do not now. We're going to have this close, intimate relationship. You and I. That's how significant you are in my kingdom, in my eyes. That's huge. A special relationship with Christ himself. And then finally in verse 13, as with all the churches, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, the question is, where are you residing today? There's only two places you can be. You're either in the synagogue of Satan, or you're in the family of God. 
One of the two. And I know that's hard. And I know we're not supposed to talk like that because we're just not. But sometimes we need to hear that. Sometimes we need to understand the stark reality. There is a time when time will be no more. And when that time comes, there will be no time to decide to follow Jesus. Now is the time. You want eternal life? You want the benefits of the kingdom? Decide to follow Jesus. God is still calling his people into the kingdom. And it doesn't matter. Your background doesn't matter. Your financial status doesn't matter. Your anything. If the Holy Spirit is calling you, I would encourage you, decide to follow Jesus. Be the best decision you ever make. Pray with me, please. Lord Jesus, thank you that we are indeed saved by grace. That we're kept by grace. And that one day, by your grace, we will step into eternity and receive our eternal rewards. You promise us that. And in the meantime, you ask us to remain faithful to your name, to your gospel, to your church. And so, Lord, we endeavor to do, even while recognizing how many times we fail. And yet every time you forgive, you restore. And Lord, if there's anyone here that's never really decided to follow you, I'd pray that they would make this the day when simply in the quietness of their hearts they would say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want you as my Savior. And know that instantly they are citizens of the kingdom of your marvelous light. And now, Father, as we look ahead to December, we look ahead to celebrating your Advent, we ask that you will bless that time, that you will be able to look upon Parkside Church with favor in your eyes. We ask all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh,